So hi, I'm Mike Vitovich. I'm a professor at the University of Kansas in the Department of Psychology. And most people don't like to make mistakes. But there's actually a lot you can learn from your mistakes and the mistakes of others, especially for language scientists. Um, language scientists, in many ways, have tried to collect speech errors over the years, over the many decades, actually. Uh, in the area of speech production, uh, Vicki Fromkin was one of the first people to start keeping a diary of various kinds of speech errors. She would walk around with a little pen and pad and, and write down any time uh, anybody made a speech error. She obviously was not very popular as a result of that with uh, parties and things like that. But uh, the diary, the collection of errors that she accumulated over many, many, many years has been invaluable for researchers to comb through and try to find patterns. Because when we make mistakes, when a system breaks, it doesn't break randomly. It doesn't break uh, at chance. It breaks in the weak points. And by studying where those weak points are, we get a better understanding of how a system might be built. So in terms of a language system, a language processing system, studying the different patterns of errors that occur help us better understand how the language system might be built. Fortunately, we make lots of different kinds of errors. We make production errors. So there are errors known as spoonerisms, where you switch the sounds of, of neighboring words. So um, the bean was dizzy. I mean, the dean was busy today, so I had to uh, reschedule my appointment with him. Uh, there are instances where we use the wrong word that sort of sounds like that word, but it's not exactly the right word to use. So uh, a favorite example that I actually uh, witnessed, that I actually heard, was somebody talking about the, the pop singer Mariah Carey and how she really hits those high octanes when she sings. Octane is, of course, something with gasoline, not with music. They were thinking of octaves. But they came out with a similar sounding word that wasn't quite right. Uh, if you accumulate enough of these errors, you can, again, see where these weak points are and understand the way the system might be built. What's difficult about accumulating enough examples to be able to find those patterns is accumulating enough examples to find those patterns. As humans, when we speak, we make about one error out of every thousand words. So you've got to be in the right place at the right time if you're Vicki Fromkin with this notepad to be able to hear that error yourself and be able to pick up on it. Uh, kids make about three or four errors per thousand words. So again, we're pretty accurate. The system is built really well, uh, very robustly, to be able to produce speech clearly and quickly and efficiently. So you've got to be in the right spot at the right time to pick up on those errors. Uh, as a result, some people developed ways to study errors in the laboratory, to make people make errors in the laboratory. So these are things like the spoonerisms of laboratory-induced predispositions, the sl slips technique. Uh, so you, you are given two words, uh, flash up on the screen, you're supposed to read them out loud. Uh, you get another set of words, again, read them out loud, read them out loud. And... Um, Every once in a while, the, the letters of the initial the initial letters of the words change. So you're going uh, with a BP word, a BP word, a BP word, and then suddenly you're given a BP word, and and you tend to switch those up and make a mistake. Uh, again, uh, we're very efficient. Even when we're trying to force you to make a mistake, you don't do so very often. Uh, another way to elicit errors to make people try to make mistakes is with tongue twisters. You may have done these when you were a little kid. Uh, she sells seashells by the seashore, right? Those kinds of things. It's using the same principle as what people have done in the slips technique in the laboratory. You, you kind of reverse these, these sounds in, uh, repeatedly, and then you kind of don't. And that, that, that um, break in the pattern makes you make a mistake. Um, so people have tried to use these techniques in the laboratory as well. Some of them are, are sentences like the she sells seashells things. Others are just more bare bones kinds of tongue twisters that people have, have come up with.
Uh, and then um, other people have developed techniques to, in the laboratory, try to study different kinds of errors that we make. So more like memory errors, but still kind of language related. So the tip of the tongue phenomenon, for example. You know you know a word, you can describe it, you may even come up with words that sound similar to it, but it's not the right word. So if you're talking about uh, being in a submarine and looking out through uh, the microscope, no, the paris periscope, yeah, that's it. You may eventually come up with it, but it will take you some time. And there are uh, sort of trivial pursuit-like games that people do in the laboratory to uh, uh, try to give you just enough information to give you uh, the right word, but you still have trouble coming up with the label for it. Uh, so they'll you know, ask about the, the device you used in a submarine to let you look out. Oh, okay, I know that is, but you might stumble across uh, other things like microscope or, or uh, uh, gyroscope or something like that, which sounds similar, but is not the right word. We experience the tip of the tongue very often in real life. We experience various kinds of speech errors in real life. We make other kinds of errors too. So typing, you'll have a slip of the key. Uh, in speaking, you have a slip of the tongue. Um, if you're a user of sign language, you might have a slip of the finger, so you, d you don't produce the sign quite correctly. And it's not just in speech production that we have these errors either. We also have them perceptually as well. So how many times you you had a conversation with somebody and you heard, heard them say something, but then you kind of look at them and go, what? Oh, wait, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you answer them before they repeat the question. So you didn't quite hear it right, but you were able to sort of repair it before that really broke down, that conversation really broke down. So there are production errors, there are perception errors, there are also errors in uh, motor performance that people study, but I'm going to focus today on really just the speech errors that we kind of make, and specifically the slip of the tongue, so you say something and you kind of reverse the, the sounds of a word. I'm going to focus on... Um, slips of the ear, so somebody says something correctly, but you don't hear it quite correctly. And then the tip of the tongue states as well, where you know you know the word, you've used it before, but right now you just can't come up with it. Uh, the reason I'm going to focus on these three speech errors, these kinds of language errors, is because, again, they've, they've been studied in various ways in the laboratory, they've been studied with diary studies, as well. But if you're sort of new to this area and you want to better understand speech errors, which are really kind of neat and fun and everybody experiences them, so they're, they kind of are a natural draw to bring people into uh, to the language sciences. If you, if you are just trying to break into this area, it's very difficult to get your hands on these collections, on these corpora of, of errors. Uh, they're very, very useful, to, in some cases quite large. Uh, again, referring back to, to the work of, of Fromkin, she had uh, thousands of speech errors. And I actually, as a graduate student, wanted to try to analyze that error corpus. And so I emailed the person that was holding on to this corpus now and asked, hey, can I get a copy of, of all these speech errors? And the response back was, well, no, because each error is written on a three by five index card. Those index cards are stored in several shoe boxes. And for you to get a copy of that, I would have to have my secretary photocopy all these things and then send them to you. And, and that's not really a real efficient use of my secretary's time. So if you want them, you're welcome to come over to where we are, which was somewhere in Europe. And as a graduate student in the, in the United States, that was a little prohibitive cost-wise to be able to do that. So some of these great resources kind of stay out of reach of, of other, other researchers, which is unfortunate. And this is, of course, uh, you know, the 21st century. We're in the digital age now. So the idea of, of having a, a shoebox full of, of index cards as your source of data, as, as the only backup, is kind of just... Oh, well, it's 20th century, I guess, right? Kind of backwards. It seems kind of strange, kind of outdated. And in fact, it is, right? So given my interest in studying speech errors, given the sort of inaccessibility of a lot of these uh, resources, I decided to get together with a couple graduate students in my lab and some folks from information technology at the University of Kansas and develop a, a mobile phone app to be able to help people uh, 
record or document different kinds of speech areas. And so in a paper in Frontiers in Psychology, it's an open access journal, which means anybody can go get a copy of this for free. We describe how we developed and how to use this speech error diary application for your mobile device. Basically, again, we're trying to look at slips of the tongue, tip of the tongue states, and slips of the ear. So we're just prompting for those three kinds of speech errors. But again, there's lots of different kinds of errors that if you're interested in studying, you might be able to make something similar to this app to study those kinds of errors. What's unique about this is that we're trying to crowdsource the collection of errors. So instead of one individual researcher going around trying to record down every error that they hear, we're getting lots of people interested or trying to get lots of people interested and lots of people involved in recording those errors. So instead of just me having to document what I hear, there will be lots more ears out there documenting things, trying to catch those errors. So the likelihood of the error getting caught and then the likelihood of that database growing and growing rapidly increases greatly. The sole researcher trying to collect a bunch of speech errors will take years, if not decades, to accumulate enough errors that they can go through and find statistically significant patterns in. In a matter of months, we've been able to accumulate over 300 speech errors just by having other people listen and document in the app the errors that they hear. In addition to trying to make it easily accessible to people, to make it more widespread in use, we're hoping that this application and the data that it collects and compiles is around for quite a while. Vicki Frompton is, of course, dead, and so she's not going around with that notebook anymore collecting more speech errors. People who have done diary studies for tip-of-the-tongue states, like Debbie Burke, have given people a diary to try to record their errors and document their errors, but you can only ask participants to do this for so long before they get sick and tired of doing it and stop doing it. So maybe a couple of months' worth of data from people. Whereas this online application allows people, hopefully longer than I'm around, to continue to build on this database and add to the number of errors that are there, adding to the statistical analyses to the power and so forth that you could use to find those patterns that might be interesting. We're also hoping that by using mobile technology, by using phones and iPads and things like that, that we'll be able to get more people interested in collecting these speech errors, because they are kind of fun, they are kind of interesting, and even people who aren't language scientists are kind of interested in them. There's a movement of citizen scientists, people who are interested in advancing science, giving a little bit of their time to help out different scientific endeavors. And so we see this as a way to sort of take advantage of that kind of movement and getting people who make speech errors all the time, well, not all the time, right, but who do make speech errors, who do witness them and listen to them, to give them back to science and let us better understand how the language system might be built. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. That concludes argument in this case.